I just want to completely level with you uh, before I crack on. Um, I really do feel that God has given me a message, if I can get through it without crying. Um, I do feel that God's given me a message for today. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to communicate it perfectly. I'm not going to communicate it perfectly. But I just pray that you guys receive what God is wanting to say through me um, this morning. So I'm going to pray and invite his presence. If you would join me, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> Jesus, you are so good. You are always good, and you never stop being good. And I ask, Holy Spirit, would you move in this place? Would you speak what you want to say? Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Amen. So I, uh, I believe there is a consecration um, going on in us and in the broader church at the moment. Um, I believe that God is preparing us for how he might want to move next how we might want to move next through his people in power. And I believe that he is preparing the way for a real outpouring um, of his presence. And I believe that this, uh, there is an invitation into greater holiness. I think it's an invitation into greater holiness. Now, holiness means to be set apart or um, set apart from the world or to be different. However, holiness is way more than that. Holiness is wholeness. It's fullness of life and freedom. And I think there can be a danger um, to solely focus on this sort of separation element, measuring ourselves of sort of how separate from the world we are or sort of how holy we are, and forget to focus on the one that is holy, the one that is completely other, the one that can only make us holy, God. And so I believe then that a deeper, at a deeper level, holiness is a devotion or a consecration to someone. So as we worship and devote ourselves to him, we are made holy, not the other way around. Uh, six months ago, I um, was worshipping, we were having a service um, on a Sunday in Nottingham, and, um, and we were worshipping in, in our um, in a usual way, and I, we were singing a song, I think, about God sort of raising up an army. Um, and I was um, singing it, and I felt um, God say to me, Amy, I'm raising up a weak army. I'm raising up a weak army. And then I saw a picture, so that sort of flashed through my head, and then I saw a picture of people, and it was a line of people, like an army line, and instead of standing there with armor on and weapons drawn, ready to fight, I actually saw a sea of people face down on their knees in complete and utter surrender and awe and love and devotion and worship to God. I then saw, as all of these people were uh, kneeling down, I just saw this power come and overtake them. I saw his power come and overtake them as they were kneeling down before God. And my sense was that he is raising up a people who give their everything to him. The good stuff, the bad stuff, the ugly stuff. And it's in complete Surrender, devotion, and worship, as though nothing else matters, when nothing else matters at all. And it was from this posture that God pours out his power and his presence. And so I want to talk today about this posture. What does it mean for us to have this posture? Complete dependence upon him. Complete dependence upon him. 
And, you know, I have been on a journey personally uh, in regard to this. You know, I want this so much for my own life. You know, I want to be so utterly in love with God that nothing else matters. Nothing else matters at all. That I am just so in love that the, it just overflows from me. I want to care less about myself. I want to care less about myself. I want to serve him only, his kingdom, and his people. Okay, so we're talking about devotion. What then is devotion? I love this definition. It's a wholehearted commitment to a person or a cause. And we read in Matthew uh, 22, 37, it says, Jesus asked by the Pharisees basically what the greatest commandment is. And he says to them, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And, you know, this is taken from Deuteronomy um, 6 in the Old Testament when Moses receives the Ten Commandments. And God says to Israel, Hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You know, this word love in Deuteronomy, this isn't a romantic notion. It's not um, a love about a feeling or whether we sort of want to love or not, but it's a covenant obedience. It's a covenant obedience. It's a covenant love. It is a promise to God of single-minded fidelity. It's interesting, actually, because in other texts, this, this same word, love, that we read in Deuteronomy, it refers to things like loyalty, faithfulness, and even being allies to. So consequently, when we hear then in the Old Testament about loving and hating the other, it doesn't mean not to like in the sense that we know it today, but it means not to be in special covenant relationship with. So the central idea then is that God's love and hatred is a question of covenant relationship. For example, when Jesus says that you must hate your father and, um, and mother um, to be a true disciple, he isn't saying hate your parents as we know it today, but he's um, basically saying your mother and father are not to be your primary covenant relationship. And so when Jesus talks about not having two masters in Luke 16, you must love one and hate the other in the Old Testament, it was impossible to have a covenant obedience to two kings at the same time. And so this is what Jesus is speaking into. You have to obey the covenant stipulations of one king or another. It is impossible to have two masters. And, you know, we have so many masters in our lives, don't we? <laughs> Things that we uh, think keep us in control our addictions, our fears, our shame, what people think of us, our regrets, our own self-image. It might be food, relationships, jobs, achievements, our finances. The list just goes on and on. And devotion looks like giving over all these masters to him. Devotion looks like a covenant relationship where God is the one true master. And I just believe that this is what he is calling his people into. This is what he is calling us into. And you know, this, folks, is what freedom is. This is what freedom is. Our devotion leads to true freedom. Our devotion leads to true freedom. This is, why, this is why God wants our devotion, because when we devote ourselves to him, we turn away from our sin, which ultimately destroys us and keeps us held back. And so it isn't about focusing on getting free or buying all the latest sort of, health, health, um, sort of health, uh, self-help books or striving even for what our culture perceives to be perfect, but focusing on who God is and what he says about you. You know, we were never actually supposed to be the judge of our lives. We weren't supposed to be the judge of our lives. We weren't meant to decide what was good and evil, if we go back to Genesis. And so we weren't to decide what is beauty and what is ugly. 
We were never meant to decide what is strong and what is weak, or what is clever and what is stupid. But only God can decide that. Only God. What he says to be true is that we are his children, that he made us, that he loves us, that he wants intimacy with us, and that in Jesus' death and resurrection, there is now no condemnation, that we are completely and utterly forgiven. Now, I have been uh, meditating um, a lot, actually, on uh, Jesus' anointing at Bethany, and I've actually forgotten my Bible. Can you grab me my Bible? Um, I'm just going to read, actually, from John's Gospel, uh, 12, verse 1 to 8. So if you've got a Bible, um, grab it. I'm just going to have a quick drink. Okay, hang on. Okay, starting from verse, I'm going to start from verse 3. So uh, John 12, verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what he wanted. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Now, I just think that she is a picture of pure devotion. I feel like this scripture is a picture of pure devotion. And so this then is a picture of freedom. She is a picture of pure freedom. She embodies what freedom truly means for us. She embodies what freedom truly means for us. Complete and utter surrender and dependence on one master. Her devotion leads to freedom. So what then can we learn? What is she free from as we go through this passage? Firstly, she's free to approach Jesus. She kneels down before him. She trusts that he isn't going to push her away or reject her. She takes the risk and believes what she knows to be true about him. And I believe there's an invitation today to approach Jesus. And he says, come to me. He says, come to me. All that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For some, you know, this is a brave move today. It might be really, really challenging to say yes to Jesus or to come to him today. You might have felt really let down by Jesus Or perhaps you even doubt that he even cares about you at all. But, you know, he wants to meet us exactly where we are. He wants to meet us today in our imperfection, in our doubts, and in our pain. And he wants us today to encounter his love again, his grace and his mercy. To hear his voice of approval and acceptance once more to hear his pleasure over us. And I said said really simply as I was driving over to Birmingham, I said, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And I simply heard him say, I just want to tell them that I love them, no strings attached. I love you, no strings attached, is what he wants to say today. 
So she's free to approach Jesus. Her devotion leads her to be free to ignore. Firstly, to ignore the disapproval around her. She is surrounded by people who disagree with her actions. In fact, her actions were completely and utterly shameful in this culture. Jesus should have repelled her because according to Pharisaic Pharisaic tradition, the very touch would have made him unclean. And the Pharisees, according to later Jewish writings, actually forbid women to stand nearer to them than four cubits. And yet she is touching and wiping his feet with her hair. I mean, this is unbelievably radical. This act would have been so unbelievably disturbing. Jewish women didn't let their hair down in public, ever. This is an expression of devotion that would have come across as actually extremely improper and actually slightly erotic. She breaks through the shame. I mean, the shame she would have felt in that room. But, you know, she breaks through that shame and all those disapproving voices. And she goes straight to Jesus and devotes herself to him. You know, she is single-minded in her approach to Jesus. It is irrelevant to her what anyone thinks in that room. And therefore, she's free. She is free. Oh, don't you want this more? Don't you want this more? Able to look a complete fool in obedience and love and devotion to Jesus. Not give a monkeys what anyone thinks around you. I just want this so much for my life. I want this. I want to look a fool for God. How often are we held back? How often are we held back in sort of saying yes to God for fear of what other people think or fear that other people don't think we can do it? This devotion leads her to ignore the disapproving voices in the room. She also is able to ignore the voices in her head. You know, there must have been so many internal voices going on for her in that moment. You know, the voices that would have been saying, what are you doing, Mary? Who are you? Who are you to do this? Oh, Jesus might be angry. It's not the time he's eating, you know. Or, um, you know, or you're just merely a woman. This is a man's world. You're a woman. Get back. Get back. Or even, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. Any of those voices sound familiar? You know, it's the shame voice, isn't it? The shame voice that we all carry. The voice that is telling us you can't, you're not good enough, you're too much, you're not enough. This, this voice of condemning your every move. And, you know, she overcomes this shame voice by clutching at Jesus' feet She overcomes it, not by willpower or self-help, but by clinging to his feet. And that's what he's asking of us today. That we wouldn't just get through the shame voice in our head, but we would cling to Jesus' feet in pure devotion. Because in Jesus' presence, there is no shame. There is no shame in his presence. She holds on to him. She holds on to him. There is no shame in Jesus' presence. I just want to say that. There is no shame in Jesus' presence. He is not going to shame you. He is not going to shame you. His open arms are saying, cling to me and I will wipe you of all shame. Cling to me. Cling to me. Okay, thirdly, he is, she is free in her devotion to give it all. She gives absolutely everything. She gives her livelihood. You know, the, this perfume, as we read, was worth a year's wages. Who would put a year's wages at Jesus' feet? I know that would be a challenge for me. You know, even letting down her hair. It wasn't just a radical move because it was a cultural scandal. But but hair, in biblical um, times, it was a sign of glory. It was a sign of her glory. So she's placing her glory at his feet. 
You know, it's her whole worth in his hands. This is complete abandonment. This is complete abandonment, undignified devotion to Jesus. And it's powerful, and it's powerful. And you know, she isn't doing this to win any brownie points or to look impressive, but it's pure response of pure love. Pure response of pure love. And you know, if, jo- if devotion then, um, if devotion enables this freedom, how then might we grow? And I'm just going to offer re- like four really simple things where we might grow in this devotion, how we can fall in love more with Jesus that will enable this freedom in our lives. Firstly, we practice. You know, we need to create good rhythms um, in our lives that put him at the center, that put him at the center. You know, these practices, they are not holy in themselves. They are not holy in themselves. They take you to the one that is holy. These practices promote and provide a platform for the presence of God because it's contact with God that transforms us. Not the practice in itself, but it's the contact with God that transforms us. You know, for me, I read some scripture in the morning, or I pray, I practice fasting once a week, or, and practice even kindness. You know, our church, actually, my alarm just went off, but our church in Nottingham, we set our alarm uh, at, for 12 o'clock um, each day. Um, and basically, we set our alarm that, uh, that goes off at, the, at midday, and it's to pray the Lord's Prayer. And so every day, we pray the Lord's Prayer at midday. And again, that's not holy in itself, but it's a way of bringing him into the center of our lives, that we can practice and in getting into good rhythms of bringing him into everything that we are doing. Have I just, I just want to give um, permission, though, that this will look really different for everybody. You know, how we um, devote and how we connect with God is so different. Everybody relates to him in completely different ways. One person's devotion is not the same as somebody else's. And so I would just encourage you, go find how you connect with God. There are no rules with this. Just go and find, how can I connect um, with you, God? Okay, Secondly, remember, I was uh, recently talking to a friend about my longing uh, to just grow more in love with him, you know, how I can sort of step into this message, how I can step into greater devotion, where I care less about myself but want to give my all um, to Jesus. And I was reminded of when I first encountered God, how he utterly changed my life. And I remembered, what, um, I remembered sort of in that moment what my life looked like before, what he had saved me from, how broken I was. And I remembered um, how everything I did from that moment was just a complete overflow of love and devotion. You know, when I fell in love with Jesus, and I'm going to talk about my story in a minute, when I fell in love with Jesus, I didn't know any of the Christian lingo. I didn't know the rules of how to love him. I just met him completely fell in love with him, and then it just came from that place. And so I think I I just want to challenge you to, even what it would look like today, to just remember, why are you here? Why do you follow Jesus? Why do you call yourself a Christian? Remember his faithfulness. Remember what he's done in your life. Remember that moment that you fell in love with him, and it will sort of bring you back to that pure devotion again. Thirdly, we choose You know, devotion is a combination of two things, emotion and choice. And we have been given the ability to choose. And I think, honestly, we can blame others, can't we, for um, our lives, uh, not, not taking responsibilities for the choices that we make. And, you know, we simply need to say no to the stuff that's not good for us. Sometimes it is just down to make good choices, Say no to the use or overuse of stuff. Pick good friends, people who are honest and that you can be vulnerable with, people who will encourage you in your devotion and your walk with God. You know, people who aren't going to tear you down or seek to compare themselves with you, people who will speak truth to you. 
And you know, simply, I know you all know this, but just be aware of the stuff that you watch, the stuff that you read that just sort of um, fuels lies and jealousy and competition and condemnation. Just have, a, have an awareness of what you're feeding your soul. You have a choice. We have a choice to begin to say no to stuff. We have a choice to make our lives look a certain way in how we are feeding ourselves. And, you know, when we talk about devotion or giving over ourselves completely, it can be, um, it can feel like a really grand thought, can't it? Like a, a thought that is so unattainable. And, however, I think it's a massive part of it is just making good choices step by step by step and asking him in, asking him in to every choice that you make. Give him access into your day. You know, we don't grow in devotion by accident. We don't grow in devotion by accident. We pursue him. We pursue him. And we put practice in place to pursue him. Okay, fourthly, I am coming into land. But most importantly, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.17, which is my favorite verse of all time. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's why I am passionate about his presence. I am passionate about his presence. Because when we are in his presence, he's making us free. When he is there, he is freeing us. And he is the only one that can set us free. And it is the grace of his Holy Spirit in us, sanctifying us, making us become more devoted, therefore more free people. And he wants us to simply give it all over to him, surrendering it all, stop serving the other masters, because we were created to worship God only. You know, we were created to worship God only. This is what we were designed for. This is what we were designed for. Anything outside of that will just lead to death. It's what we were designed for. And so just really practically, all this looks like is letting him in. Letting down the defenses, breaking down the walls, stop the excuses, stop pretending that everything is okay. Let him in and then just see what he does. Simply say, okay, God, you can have this part. You can have this. You can have this insecurity. You can have this doubt. You can have this addiction. You can have this pain, this, this our relationships, the career, all of it. But it's just simply saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm gonna give it to you. That's it. And then just see what he does. You know, God has set me free from many things that have held me back in my life. That's why I'm passionate about seeing others set free. You know, my story, um, in a nutshell, I grew up in a wonderful Christian home with a wonderful sister <laughs> and, uh, and brothers. But we, um, <laughs> um, I grew up, uh, you know, going to church, the rest of it, but I never really, um, I never really owned my faith. Um, I sort of went because I sort of did that. But I, it was never, I never sort of, um, well, I was never sort of walking with Jesus myself. And uh, anyway, I went, I sort of had a decent school life and, uh, you know, sort of got through it, no problem. And then went to university. And it's like my whole world just crashed around me. It was like I had a mirror to my face. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I sort of was exposed in some way of who I actually was. And I felt so uh, deeply insecure, so um, anxious, uh, full of shame. You know, I had a, uh, just a sort of making bad choices all the time, wanting to find so much identity in what I looked like. You know, I, was, um, I, I sort of lived with this 
barrage of, um, of voices in my head that were, you know, sort of uh, that wanted to control what I ate. I would spend hours in the gym trying to sort of find a sense of identity of like, oh, if I look okay, then it's going to be okay. If I look all right, then people will love me. You know, it was such an empty, empty, empty time. You know, there are times in my university life where um, I would just lock myself in my room. I just, I just could not come out. The sort of the self hate was just so strong that I wouldn't even want to sort of leave my room. And so that was sort of where I was at. And then toward the end of my university year, in my third year, um, I actually uh, began to uh, see my sister change in her own journey and in her own story. She. Um, she began to uh, recommit her life to Jesus. And honestly, she became kinder. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it really struck me. She just was really interested. And I was like, oh, and she was telling me all about how she sort of fallen in love with Jesus again. And I was like, Do you know, there's got to be something in this. And so in my third year, I just began to sort of ask more questions. What is this? What is this all about? Started reading the Bible, went to Alpha's. And I sort of decided in my head, you know, I was like, Do you know, what? I think this is right. I think this is real. I think that I believe everything. Everything makes sense. And sort of decided in my head, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is good. And then I said the prayer about a thousand times at Alpha. You're like, I'm in, God, I'm here, I'm praying. I'm, you know, you know, say the sinner's prayer over and over and over again. Um, and then I decided to go traveling. So I was about sort of 21 at this time. And, uh, and I went traveling with some friends. And we did this sort of whole kind of after university gap year thing where uh, we did sort of Thailand, Australia, and America, and all that stuff. And I, uh, and I was in Australia, and, uh, and like I said, I sort of packed my bags full of um, books to sort of find out more about God, and I wanted to really keep this alive. But as I sort of went on, and I went with some non-Christian friends, um, it just dwindled, you know, it sort of, I decided in my head, but I, well, nothing was really changing. Nothing was really changing. And uh, anyway, it ended up in a conference in Sydney, and... Um, uh, and my sister was there because her, um, she was there with, her, with Tim and they were um, leading and they were saying, come to this conference. So I came and I went and it was all about uh, Jesus. And, uh, and there was a call to come forward um, to receive him afresh. And I came forward um, and, uh, and I came forward to the front and I just remember standing there with my arms open and... Uh, and I just said to God, make yourself real to me. Make yourself known to me. And honestly, I was standing there for ages. And I was begging him. I was begging him to make himself known to me. And I was like, God, you can have my everything. You can have it all. You can have my life. Just make yourself known to me. Make yourself real. And in that moment, he filled me with his presence. And it, he filled me in a way that I had never experienced before. He filled me with such a sense. Such a sense of love. Such a sense of purpose and hope. And it was like, and it was like uh, my life made sense for the first time. And I woke up that next morning. And everything changed, honestly. My, it was like the veil had come off my eyes. And it was like I saw color. I saw, um, I saw myself differently. And my desires changed. A lot of my desires shifted overnight. The power of God just changing things overnight. And just on a side note, just as we're speaking, I just feel like there are some people here who want that who actually even sat here like, I just want God to make himself known to me. Maybe it's again, and maybe it's for the first time. And so I just feel in my spirit, just to, to maybe at the end, just come forward and say that simple prayer. Make yourself known to me, God. Make yourself known to me again, and just see what he does. And you know, from that moment, the journey continues, and I'm 38 now, um, and it is... <laughs> <laughs> and it has just, and you know, it's been a journey of him liberating me, bringing me more and more and more freedom. As honestly, I fall more in love with him and 
as I give him access, as I give over the stuff that has been holding me back, all of the stuff as I've given it over to him, he has transformed it because his power can transform us. You know, he has met me in powerful ways. He has met me in powerful ways where, you know, I've been asking God into particular pain and there's snot and there's crying and it's like, you know, God just really sort of healing my deep, deep parts of who I am. But a lot of it has been with him, hand in hand with Jesus, just gently giving over layer upon layer upon layer of the masters in my life. That's what it's looked like. That's what it's looked like. And you know, it can feel really scary. It can feel really scary because some of the stuff that we hold on to, we think is keeping us safe. We think it's keeping us safe. But you know, that is a complete and utter lie. It is a lie that the other masters in your life are keeping you safe. It is a lie. And we need to give over those. And I just wanted to say, though, that, you know, he, he has never, ever forced. It's, been, it's never by force. You know, him asking to have stuff. Sometimes I just hear him say, oh, you know, oh, that, that piece of control or that thing, that master. Can I have that, Amy? Because it's hurting you. Can I have that? It's hurting you. It's never, give me that because you're a bad person. You know, oh, you're not good enough. You're not. It's never shame, never condemnation. It is in his pure kindness that he wants to liberate us from these other masters because they are destroying us. Because they are destroying us. He's so much kinder than we think he is. He's so much kinder. I'm always, always amazed at how kind he is. And, and how loving and gentle he is. He really is truly gentle and kind. And he wants to meet with us today. And I just want to say for those in the room who think that freedom is impossible, it really, truly is possible. It truly is possible. There are chains in my life. There are ways in my life where the enemy was holding me back, chaining me down, that just are not there anymore. They are not there anymore. I have experienced complete freedom in some of these places where the enemy has wanted to hold me back. And I just want to say that it is possible. It really, truly is possible to be free. You don't have to live with the chains that are holding you back anymore. Okay, coming into land, honestly. To go back to uh, this woman, the woman that we were talking about, I just absolutely love how Jesus responds. I love how Jesus responds. Jesus gives her dignity. Jesus gives her dignity in a room of shame. Jesus gives her dignity in a room of shame. He says, why are you bothering her? Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. She has done a beautiful thing to me. And as she pours out her devotion, he holds her up high. She doesn't need to hold herself up high. As she pours her devotion, as she kneels before him, he's holding her up high. He holds her up high. He dignifies her. He dignifies her. He gives her status in a room where she shouldn't have any. She gives, he gives her status in a room where she shouldn't have any. And it's really interesting, as, as you read the versions of this through the Gospels, that in Mark and Matthew's reading, this, this story, the woman is never named. The woman's never named. She's just called a woman. You know, they didn't even dignify her with a name. Didn't even dignify her with her name. Yet Jesus says in, the, in Mark, it says, I tell you the truth. 
Whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What then is this woman's legacy? We're talking about legacy today. What is this woman's legacy? It certainly wasn't her name because it wasn't even written down in some of the gospels. Or her career, we know nothing. Family, her looks, her position, her achievements, her status, approval, her social media platform, even her level of contribution. None of that is her legacy. What is it? What was she remembered by? She's remembered by pure devotion. Her devotion is her legacy. Her devotion is her legacy. And I just think that that is a challenge for me, and that is a challenge for us. Will your devotion be your legacy? Put all your energies into devoting yourselves to Jesus. Will your devotion be your legacy, what you're remembered for? Total surrender, total dependence upon him. Will you allow it to be your legacy?